In this video, I'm going to show you my new best settings for Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 on PS5, including graphics settings, HDR calibration, audio settings, and the new controller and DualSense Edge settings to gain more accuracy while playing and easily control your aim for both close and long range while having the option to rotate fast and switch positions in the game and how to get a keyboard response type on your controller for movement. Let's dive into it. The graphics settings. We already talked about on-demand texture streaming in the last video, which can help for higher picture quality and color details as you play the game. Due to multiple tests I made, it may affect your controller or network latency in the game, and in some cases it causes a higher input delay from the controller, around 10 to 34 milliseconds at its max for some maps. So I did turn it off. Still, it's not going to ruin the game, so you can keep it on to get a higher picture quality and set a daily download limit for it to not overuse your data plan. Onto the next part, post-processing effects. I'd prefer to keep word motion blur off, as it adds blurriness to the picture while rotating the camera, and I find it harder to spot the enemies. My personal choice is to keep it off. The same for weapon motion blur. The film grain option adds old style grain effect to the picture. This kind of dots and some people like it. I don't like it. Especially in 120Hz, the game already has too many visual artifacts and film grain would just ruin the picture even on my 27-inch monitor. I also kept depth of field off, so every part of the picture will be sharp and in focus regardless of where I'm looking or aiming at. The fidelity effects CAS is an option to help with image sharpness which isn't great but can help with a sharper picture especially if you choose to play on 120Hz mode. Here's the max amount versus off. I'd like to keep it somewhere between 50 to 80. It doesn't have a huge affection. We have echo mode here which can help reduce energy consumption on the menus. It reduces frame rate to around 60 when using efficiency mode. And if you choose low consumption, it goes under 48 fps and maybe around 30 fps area. And there is a significant visual drop on the menus. I'm gonna cover this option and how it affects the power down from the PS5 or loading times in the next video. As I'm waiting for a new tool to arrive that can measure the power being used by a specific device. For now, you can keep it on or off. If you want to ensure the menus are as fast and as smooth as possible, you must choose off. It says it won't affect the in-game performance or visuals, but I have to test it with my new tool to confirm it. Here we have 120Hz mode. The game is pretty stable on 120fps if you use a lower field of views than 100 in most cases. And if your screen supports 120Hz, I'd highly recommend it, as it gives you lower picture delay and also the controller delay is noticeably lower compared to 60Hz mode. It's a must in such game in my opinion. There's a nice option with the name of inverted flashbang. This option will reduce the flashlight effect and makes the screen darker when being affected by flash grenade instead of making it brighter. I found it useful to not harm my eyes especially when I play in a darker environment. Now let's talk about HDR settings and HDR versus SDR and which one do I recommend to use. The game uses PS5 system calibration exactly as it should. You can change any in-game options and for any further adjustments you must use PS5's calibration. As I tested it on 15 clicks which are around 972 nits on PS5, it was following the calibration in the correct way, without any problems. Even for step 3 of 3, the black color stays on 0 nits and any changes you make on the step 3 will brighten the dark areas. There aren't dark maps for multiplayer mode yet but it could be useful for future. So what is my recommended settings for HDR. Make steps 1 and 2 of 3 barely visible. If the sun is clearly visible, go one step higher to blend it into the background. For step 3 of 3, even if you make it 0 clicks, there won't be any black level crush. Increasing it also won't change the floor, so use what you like. I'm keeping it one step higher than 0 for my LG C2. You can make it 0 clicks and there won't be any issues. If you have a problem seeing details in dark areas, you can increase it but it can cause a lower contrast overall and the picture may become washed out. You can also check my other video to find out how many clicks do you need for your TV based on the needs from ratings.com. What about SDR? One thing I've noticed is when I'm using HDR and there are certain spots with peak brightness, it pushes the console even more and there might be some drop frames or higher controller input delay meaning it increases the time that is needed for console to respond to the controller actions. To prove this, we have to wait for my new tool, which measures the console power and HDR versus SDR usage 
storage and how is that going to increase the delay of the controller. But in terms of visuals, SDR looks very fine without any problems. The contrast is fine, black level is good and it looks bright enough. So if SDR looks better on your TV or monitor, don't hesitate and use SDR instead of HDR, especially for low contrast screens like monitors, IPS panels that don't feature local limbing or high contrast. SDR could be a much better option. On SDR we have the brightness option and 50 is the best spot on both of my screens. Yet if you can see the logo on the left side for any reason, maybe a wrong RGB range, decrease it until it's not visible. And if you can't see the middle picture at all, increase it until you can see the logo. In my case, 47 makes second picture barely visible. And from 47 to 50 would be a good spot for both having high contrast and details. Now we have the audio settings. Just like all other options, the 3D audio would be automatically enabled once you enable it on the PS5. The game doesn't have a specific 3D audio design or mix to help with separating the footstep sounds from guns or explosions and putting them in other channels at different heights or stuff like that. But just gives you a virtual higher space feeling and in some cases you might be able to guess where the audio comes from exactly compared to a stereo. If it was a game like Spider-Man 2 I would suggest 3D audio for headphones but it's not so try both play one game with a stereo and one with 3D audio. Feel free to use what you like but if you want my personal choice I'm using stereo on Pulse 3D headset. However the headphones with bass boost mix helps with some kind of footstep sounds that are in bass and low frequencies but I found it a bit too much on Pulse 3D. Overall I prefer headphones mode when you play with headphones but try both of them and listen to the sound of it on different surfaces and decide which is better for you. TV mode has the tightest dynamic range, meaning the quiet sounds will be also louder, but I found it a bit annoying as the gunshots would blow my head due to high compression. So for headphones, give all three a chance, I'm good with headphones mode. The volume settings are personal, and based on my test, they never pass 0 decibels, even at 100%. Feel free to keep it as high as you want. I also use reduced and sound, which are the frequencies that may bother your ears in some sound effects, and it just feels better to me. Hit marker sound effects off because nowadays I'd like to be more focused on important sound effects rather than the ones that just makes too much data to process in my head. If you play with Pulse 3D headset, this is the EQ I'm currently using with headphones mix. If you feel something is off, just play with EQ settings. I don't recommend changing low frequency, as that's already too high on Pulse 3D by default. The rest is your choice. We have the HUD settings and an option for damage based hit markers, meaning when the enemy has lower health the marker becomes red. I like that. I also use server latency and packet loss to ensure my connection is fine. There is another option with the name of connection meter which does the same thing but has different visual. I don't like it because it covers too much of the screen space. The clock option will sync the game clock with your system's clock. Cool, but I don't like it. Thanks. In the account and network section you can turn off crossplay which will increase search times. But I wish there was an option only to turn off crossplay for PC players. The rest are fine. Anyways, I keep it on. In the network info you can see your region and the server you are connected to. But more importantly your NAT type. Moderate is fine but the strict might bother you in games and finding matches. I have a full video of how to get open NAT type on modern warfare games even if you have NAT type 2 in the console. You can get open NAT type by port forwarding or DMZ. You can check that video from the cards or the link in the description below. But what are my new controller settings? First of all for those who are new to the channel, I have a full video of the best PS5 controller settings for DualSense and Edge for Modern Warfare 3 which I released recently with advanced testing and information. But here I'm gonna give you my new settings for DualSense and DualSense Edge. For both controllers I'm using horizontal and vertical sensitivity at 9 if I'm playing for mid range. When I play with long range weapons I prefer 6 to 7 which is for the time you are not aiming and makes you fast to rotate or change position. Instead I have ADS sensitivity which is for when you are aiming with L2 on 0.65. If you tried it and felt it's fast for you you can lower it. If it's too slow you can make it closer to 1. If you want your camera to be faster but aim slower then increase sensitivity and lower ADS value. For example 10 and 0.60. I also kept tactical stance sensitivity multiplier on 0.90 because I usually use it on close to mid range when I need faster movement and more space on the screen. It helps me. 
all of these settings are used with dynamic aim response curve which is like this and compared to other curves it's faster at a start to get closer to the target than becomes slower at higher pushes which helps to be more steady for aim assist if you are not used to such curve first practice in private for 5 to 10 minutes to understand how to use it Otherwise, linear or standard might be a better choice for many. But there is another option I recommend trying before making the final decision. We have aim response curve slope scale. This option changes the curve just like what we have for edge. So if I make it zero, the curve becomes more linear. As more you change it, as closer it gets to the reversed S curve. Similar to the curve adjustment on edge, but instead of 10 steps, we have 100 steps. For dynamic, I'm using it on 0.85, but how does it change the shape exactly that's for another in-depth video if you like to know start from 100 and change by 15 or 20 at a time and see which value feels better in the game and then further adjust it if you feel your aim assist doesn't work well or it's too sticky lower for more aim assist and higher for faster movements and less aim assist at the start of the curve the most important option is transition timing which is the time between your camera speed and ads speed when pushing l2 the instant will change once you push it but the gradual will slowly change the speed in time it matches my settings the best but you can give it a try after zoom would change the speed after you are fully aimed in that's a bit late for me again this option must be tested and is a personal preference i like gradual for mid-range guns and instant if i play on longer ranges for dual sense edge i'm using l2 and r2 input range from 0 to 1 with zone 3 on the controller for the fastest response especially if you play with automatic weapons for left stick sensitivity i'm using quake plus 5 which helps to get to max walking speed faster i also have control over slower speed but as i told you before if you want a keyboard like movement use digital plus 5 that's the fastest speed you can get for the least push. I'm also using circle and down d-pad for back buttons, as I use them the most. I don't use jump often, but you are free to use what you like. For the right stick curve, I kept it on default. With all settings I gave you from the game, it works the best with default for me. Feel free to experiment with it and maybe precise from minus 5 to 0 feels smoother to play with. Give it a try for one match and please let me know which setting is the most interesting for you. We have motion sensor options which can be helpful but it also has a lot of settings are you interested to see a video for this or should i cover aim assist and response curve settings for an in-depth video next time let me know in the comments section and to find out how to reduce the input lag and input delay from the controller and ps5 check this video next